The Complete Story of Moses, a Prophet and Priest of God. Listen. Listen. That's the sound of a baby abandoned in the Nile River crying. That is the sound of baby Moses crying after his mother left him in the river in a high-stake scheme to save his life. Yes, I know. It is complicated. We shall get more into this a little later. This is the complete story of Moses, a prophet and priest of God. A fascinating story of slavery, bravery, love, regret, betrayal, death, miracle, survival, and redemption. By the end of this movie, you will see there is so much to the story of Moses than you ever thought. If you watch until the end, you will learn why Satan is working overdrive even today to discover the burial place of Moses, and why God designate a special warrior angel to prevent him from doing so. Now, let's get started. Have you ever struggled with the feeling of not belonging anywhere? You are there, but you don't feel like you belong. You don't feel accepted. Neither do you feel accepting. Then you start to ask, who am I? Why am I here? Where is God in all of this? Who is God? What is the nature of God? The answers to these questions are revealed in the story of Moses. They are questions that not only Moses, but also the Israelites in general, struggled to answer. They are questions many of struggle with today. How could we not wonder? After all, it is God who chose to reveal himself to this Moses, a reluctant prophet, a hesitant priest, a doubting warrior, and a troubled youth raised in the house of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and a mortal enemy of Israel. This is the story of Moses, a man chosen by God to lead a nation in bondage. Moses was born and raised in Egypt, but his story did not start in Egypt. It started in the land of Canaan around 1950 BC when the children of Israel, formerly Jacob, sold their little brother, Joseph, into slavery. As the story goes, Joseph, through miraculous interventions, ended up in the house of King Pharaoh. He rose to prominence and became the second in command only to the king. Not long after, during what historian considered the second famine in the Bronze Age, through what can only be a divine orchestration, Jacob, Israel, and the rest of the family joined Joseph in Egypt, which at the time had plenty of food. The Israelites lived over 500 years in Egypt before Moses was born in 1393 BC. To fully grasp Moses' story, we must go back to the book of Genesis, starting with God's revelation to Abraham that his descendants will be enslaved in Egypt for many years. God says to Abraham, Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Genesis 15 verses 13 to 14. And so it was. The children of Israel who joined Joseph in Egypt became slaves in the land after his death and the installation of a new Pharaoh as king. Over centuries, the enslaved people began to outnumber the Egyptians. The new Pharaoh, feeling threatened, instituted various oppressive measures to assert control over his slaves. He tasked the Israelites to build grand temples for the worship of Egyptian God. 
contrary to the laws of their god. The Egyptians applied every wicked tactic to oppress and reduce the number of the Israelites in their land. It did not work. As God promised Abraham, they continued to grow in number and strength even as the oppressive measures increase. Then Pharaoh decided to take a drastic action. He ordered that every firstborn male child of the Hebrew people must be cast into the Nile River to drown. This was a heavy penalty the Israelites could not bear. So they increased their prayer for God to send a prophet who would free them from the bondage of slavery and the ploy of extinction in the land of Egypt. It was during this difficult period, around 1390 BC, under Pharaoh's heavy rule, that Moses was born. For Moses' mother, his birth was made exceedingly more difficult because of Pharaoh's decree. When she became pregnant, she feared that she would give birth to a boy, knowing that he would not be spared. She indeed gave birth to Moses. To protect her child, she would hide him so that no one would see that she had a male child. Moses was still a baby when she realized she could no longer hide him. It was then she decided to come up with an elaborate plan to protect her child. She decided to place him in the trust of a god who seemed to have forgotten them. She took Moses to the Nile River and set him adrift on in a tar-coated basket. Moses floated in the basket along the shore of the river. As he floated and cried, he caught the attention of Pharaoh's daughter, who was participating in a religious ceremony in a nearby temple. She quickly called her servants to fetch him up. They did. When she set eyes on Moses, she took a liking to him immediately. But then she realized the boy was a Hebrew, the child of a slave. Still, she wanted to keep the baby, but she could not take him home. As she was contemplating on what to do with the child, a young woman, a plant of Moses' mother, appeared. She informed Pharaoh's daughter that she could help her find a surrogate mother to raise the child for the princess. Pharaoh's daughter agreed at once. She instructed the servants to provide the baby and the surrogate mother everything they needed to raise the boy. Now she would have a son of her own, she bemused in excitement. She called him Moses. The name Moses in Hebrew means drawn out, symbolizing how he was pulled from the water. In Egyptian, it implies born of or son of, suggesting Moses was born of the river emerging from obscurity. He was a man without a known origin, rescued in the most improbable manner. Moses, therefore, becomes a metaphor for the Israelites, emerging seemingly from nowhere, passing through water, passing through hardship, and integrated into a family, into the family of God. When the child was old enough, Pharaoh's daughter took him to live in the palace. Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. Growing up in Pharaoh's household, Moses became intimately familiar with Egyptian culture. He was accepted by his adopted Egyptian family and loved by his adopted mother. They thought he was one of them. But Moses knew who he was. He was no Egyptian. He was Hebrew, a descendant of slaves. Not long after, Moses started to witness the violent campaigns against the Israelites. What is worse is that he was powerless to do anything about it. As the years passed, one day, burdened with knowledge of Pharaoh's campaign against the people of Israel, Moses reached his breaking point. Exodus 2 verses 11 to 12 describes how one day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. Then he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking around and seeing no one, Moses intervened and ended up killing the Egyptian. He hid his body in the sand. The next day, Moses went out again. This time, he found two Hebrews fighting. When he tried to intervene and stop the fighting, one of them would have none of it. He asked Moses if he was going to kill him as he killed the Egyptian. 
This man was not there when Moses killed the Egyptian, and yet he knew of what happened. Realizing that his secret was out, Moses feared for his life. Indeed, when Pharaoh heard of this, he felt betrayed and was enraged. He quickly ordered that Moses be found and executed. Moses fled from Pharaoh's palace, a life of luxury, to a small village of Midian. He was exhausted and hungry when he arrived, so he sat by a well. Not long after his arrival, the seven daughters of the priest of Midian, Jethro, also arrived to fetch water from the well for their father's flock. However, as they were about to get the water, some shepherds from a rival village came and drove the women away. Moses quickly intervened. He protected the women and single-handedly drove the shepherds away. He then helped the women to get water for their flock. This act of kindness and bravery greatly impressed the sisters. When the sisters returned home, they informed their father about all that happened at the well and about the Egyptian stranger, Moses, who saved them from the enemy shepherds and helped them to get water for their flock. Jethro, pleased with this act of kindness, invited Moses to stay with them. Moses agreed to live with Jethro, who then gives his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. The name Zipporah means bird in Hebrew, which could symbolize her role in helping Moses start a new life in Midian. Moses settles in Midian and starts a family with Zipporah. They have a son named Gershom, a name that reflects Moses' sense of being a stranger in a foreign land, as Gershom is Hebrew, for I have been a stranger there. This period in Moses' life represents a time of transition, preparing him for his future role as the leader of the Israelites. Moses was around 40 years old when he fled Egypt after killing an Egyptian, according to Acts 7.23. He did not return to Egypt until 40 years later. Meanwhile, in Egypt, there was a new pharaoh, whose rule was even harsher than his predecessor. He intensified the suffering of the Israelites many folds. However, this time, the cries of the slaves reached God, who was about to initiate a pivotal change, and Moses was central to his plan. While tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses leads the flock to the far side of the wilderness and comes to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then Moses noticed a bush that is burning but is not consumed by the flames. Curious, he decided to go closer to understand this strange phenomenon. As he approaches, God called out to him from within the bush, Moses! Moses! And Moses responds, Here I am. God introduces himself to Moses. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Upon hearing this, Moses hid his face, afraid to look at God. Then God tells Moses that he has seen the suffering of the Israelites in Egypt and has come down to deliver them, bringing them to a good and spacious land he promised their fathers. Moses was pleased with the news. Well, until God told him that he, Moses, would be the instrument for accomplishing this monumental task. When God tells Moses that he is to be the one to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses was shocked. He was shocked that he would be picked for the job. At first, Moses was hesitant, and then he began to lay his objections before God. He questions why God would choose him, a man who is not eloquent and has no special status. Moses says, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? To convince Moses, God gives him several signs to demonstrate his power. First, he turned Moses' staff into a snake and then back into a staff. Then he made Moses' hand leprous and then healed it again. Despite these signs, Moses remains hesitant, worried about his ability to speak eloquently. He asks God to send someone else. In response, God becomes angry with Moses at first but then agreed to send Aaron, Moses' brother, to speak on his behalf. God assures Moses that he will help both of them speak and will teach them what to do. Thus, Moses reluctantly agreed to embark on a mission that would define his legacy and alter the history and direction of the world.
Moses was now ready to confront Pharaoh, an encounter that lead to some of the most miraculous events the world would ever see. We will describe these miracles in a bit, but first, there is this strange encounter between God and Moses, recorded in Exodus 4. The Bible records a bizarre but significant incident in Exodus 4 verses 24 to 26. On the way back to Egypt, at a lodging place, the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. The passage is notably terse and cryptic about why this happened. It is indeed a strange decision that I believe is not fully explained in the story. Nevertheless, to stop God from killing her husband, Zipporah, Moses' wife, took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. She said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. After Zipporah's action, the Lord let Moses alone. The story implies that Zipporah's quick action in circumcising their son appeased God's anger, saving Moses' life. Zipporah's statement, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, is subject to various interpretations. Some have interpreted the circumcision as a ritual that bound Moses and Zipporah more closely. However, I believe it is a reference to the covenant of circumcision that God had established with Abraham and his descendants. Several interpretations and theories attempt to explain why God wanted to kill Moses. A common interpretation is that Moses had neglected to circumcise his son, which was a violation of the covenant God made with Abraham in Genesis 17 verses 9 to 14. Perhaps Moses had been repeatedly warned by God to carry out the circumcision. We don't know that for sure, but it seems likely. In any case, Moses, along with Aaron, his brother, eventually confronted Pharaoh the king of Egypt. Moses and Aaron approach Pharaoh and say, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. This request is not for permanent release, but for a temporary leave to worship God. Pharaoh's response is dismissive and defiant. He says, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh not only refuses the request, but also questions the authority and existence of the Lord, the God of Israel. Pharaoh then accuses the Israelites of being lazy, as they are asking to go and hold a festival for a God when they have work to do for him. To punish them and discourage further thoughts of freedom, he increased their workload. Previously, the Egyptians would provide the straws, a key component for the slave Israelites to make bricks. Now Pharaoh orders that the Israelites will no longer be given straw. They must now gather their own straw and still meet the same quota of bricks daily. The Israelites find themselves in a worse situation than they were before Moses intervened. They were not happy with Moses. The Israelite leaders appealed to Pharaoh for mercy, but their appeals fell on deaf ears. When they left Pharaoh, they confronted Moses and Aaron and blamed them for worsening their plight. Needless to say that Moses was devastated. He wanted to help his people, but now they are in an even bigger trouble because of him. Moses turns to God and asks why he has brought trouble to the Israelites and why he sent him if things were only going to get worse for them. God reassures him, affirming his intention to save Israel. This first encounter highlights the challenges Moses faced in his mission and sets up the dramatic confrontation between God's will and Pharaoh's stubbornness. It also began the narrative arc that led to the famous Ten Plagues, which we shall get to next. These plagues or tragedies were divine interventions to compel Pharaoh to release the Israelites from slavery. Each plague recorded in Exodus 7 escalated in intensity, demonstrating God's power over Egypt and its gods. Plague number one. God instructs Moses to turn the waters of the Nile into blood. This first plague turns all the water in Egypt into blood, killing the fish and making the water undrinkable, causing great suffering to the Egyptians. Plague number two. 
The second plague brings a massive infestation of frogs that overrun the land, entering houses, bedrooms, and even beds. Pharaoh initially promises to let the Israelites go in exchange for relief, but once the frogs die off, he hardens his heart and refuses to let them leave. Plague number three. Aaron strikes the dust of the earth with his staff, turning it into gnats or lice that came upon people and animals. The Egyptian magicians declare this to be the finger of God, but Pharaoh remains unmoved. Plague number four. Swarms of flies invade Egyptian homes and lands, but this time God spares the region of Goshen, where the Israelites lived. Pharaoh again agrees to let the people go, but reneges once the plague was lifted. Plague number five. A severe pestilence kills Egyptian livestock, but the animals belonging to the Israelites are unharmed. Despite this clear sign, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened. Plague number six. Moses and Aaron take soot from a furnace and throw it into the air, causing festering boils to break out on people and animals throughout Egypt. This time, even the Egyptian magicians cannot stand before Moses because of the boils. Plague number seven. God sends a devastating hailstorm that destroys crops and livestock and kills anyone caught outside. Pharaoh admits his sin and asks for relief, but once the storm ceases, he reverts to his stubborn refusal. Plague number eight. At Moses' command, God brings a plague of locusts that cover the land and eat everything that the hail had left. Pharaoh begs for forgiveness and relief, but once the locusts are gone, he changes his mind. Plague number nine. A thick darkness envelops Egypt for three days, a darkness so profound that people cannot see each other or leave their homes. Yet all the Israelites have light in their dwellings. Pharaoh's heart remains unyielding. After each plague, Pharaoh's heart hardens, either by his own stubbornness or as an act of God, preventing him from granting freedom to the Israelites. God then tells Moses that he will bring one more plague upon Egypt, after which Pharaoh will have no choice but to let the Israelites go. God instructs Moses to inform the Israelites about the coming plague and to prepare for their imminent departure from Egypt. Moses and Aaron warn Pharaoh about the severe plague that will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human and animal. This plague is to demonstrate God's power that will only affect the Egyptians and not the Israelites. God then instructs the Israelites to observe the Passover. Each family is to take a lamb without blemish, slaughter it, and use its blood to mark the lintels and doorposts of their houses. The blood serves as a sign for God to pass over their houses when he strikes down the firstborn of Egypt. They are to eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and remain inside their homes. On the appointed day, at midnight, the Lord strikes down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. There was a great cry in Egypt, for there is not a house without someone dead. Pharaoh quickly summons Moses and Aaron during the night and tells them to leave Egypt with the Israelites. He asks them to bless him as they go. The Egyptians, stricken with fear and mourning, urge the Israelites to leave quickly. The Israelites, heeding God's instructions, hastily prepared for departure. However, before they leave, they requested gold and silver from the Egyptians, who, overwhelmed by fear, complied. The Israelites left in haste. They depart from Ramesses toward Succoth, beginning their journey out of Egypt and towards the Promised Land. The Israelites left Egypt, but their trouble with the stubborn Pharaoh is far from over. The Israelites, led by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day, followed God's direction through the wilderness. They sang in joy and praised God for his intervention as they marched along. But when they heard that the Egyptians had changed their mind and were now coming after them with military convoy in fast-moving chariots, they became terrified. 
They started to march faster with the hope of getting out of Egypt before the approaching angry men of the Pharaoh caught up with them. But then they reached Pi Hahiroth and realized there was no way out. They found themselves trapped between the Red Sea and the advancing Egyptian army. Terrified, they started to murmur in fear. At this moment of fear, Moses did his best to reassure them. He asked them to trust in God and witness the salvation of the Almighty. This is when he made the famous inspirational statement, where he said, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Exodus 14 verses 13 to 14. Then, following God's command, Moses stretches out his hand over the Red Sea. Then God sends a strong east wind that parted the waters of the sea, creating a dry path through the middle. The Israelites passed through the sea on this dry ground, with walls of water on their left and right. Once the Israelites reached the other side, the angry but determined Egyptian army saw the miracle, but could not bring themselves to stop. They followed them into the sea path. However, at God's command, Moses stretches out his hand again, and the waters return to their normal level, drowning the Egyptian army, including Pharaoh's chariots and horsemen. That is how the Israelites were saved from the hand of Pharaoh and their pursuers. This dramatic deliverance instilled a profound fear of God among the Israelites. They recognized Him as the supreme being, sovereign over both land and sea, and capable of overpowering the Egyptian gods effortlessly. This experience provided a resounding answer to their long-standing question about God's nature. He is a God who saves. They began to sing again. They sang a song of praise and exaltation to God, acknowledging His might and salvation. But again, this would not last. They will soon forget the power of God as they faced further tribulation. As they journeyed toward Sinai, doubts crept in as they became hungry and tired. They thought they would die of starvation. They questioned the purpose of their freedom from Egypt if they end up dying in the desert. They put the blame on Moses and openly questioned God's ability to sustain them. Despite witnessing great miraculous events, the Israelites grumbled about their hardships. They taunted Moses, telling him they had it better in Egypt. Moses, frustrated, took the matter to God. God responded with another miracle. He rained food from heaven. It was a dew-like substance, which they called manna, meaning, what is it? It covered the ground, and quails appeared in abundance. This sustenance was provided for six days, with the seventh day being a day of rest. Despite this, the Israelites continued to display ingratitude and skepticism about God's power whenever they faced hardship. As recorded in Exodus 17, as the Israelites wander through the desert, they found themselves without water, and again began to complain and quarrel with Moses, expressing their distress and questioning his leadership. They ask why he would bring them out of Egypt if only to have them and their livestock die of thirst in the wilderness. Moses, distressed by the people's complaints, again cries out to the Lord for help. God instructs Moses to take his staff, the same one he used to part the Red Sea, and to strike a specific rock at Horeb. Moses is told that when he strikes the rock, water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses follows God's instructions, strikes the rock, and water miraculously flows from it. However, in a later incident recorded in Numbers 20, a similar situation arises. The people again complained about the lack of water. This time, God instructs Moses to speak to the rock to bring forth water. However, Moses, possibly out of frustration with the people's constant complaints, struck the rock twice with his staff instead of speaking to it as God had commanded. While water does come out and the people's immediate needs are met, Moses' actions have undesired consequences. 
God tells Moses that because he did not trust in him enough to honor him as holy before the Israelites, he will not be allowed to lead them into the promised land. This response from God highlights the importance of obedience and trust in God and the serious consequences of deviating from his commands, especially for those in leadership positions like Moses. Moses' actions at the rock at Meribah, which means quarreling, become a significant moment, marking a key turning point in his journey with the Israelites. This recurring theme of trust and provision was further exemplified during the Israelites' encounter with the Amalekites. As the Israelites are traveling through the desert, they are suddenly attacked by the Amalekites, a nomadic tribe living in the region. The Amalekites were known for their fierce and opportunistic warfare tactics. Significantly, they chose to attack the Israelites from the rear, targeting the most vulnerable who were lagging behind, the elderly, the weak, and the sick. When Moses saw this, he instructs Joshua, his assistant, to choose some men and go out to fight the Amalekites to protect the Israelites. In the meantime, Moses, along with Aaron and Hur, goes to the top of a nearby hill. The Bible recounts a strange aspect of this battle. As long as Moses held up his hands high, the Israelites would be winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites would start to gain the upper hand. As the battle wore on, Moses' arms became tired. Aaron and Hur, recognizing the significance of Moses keeping his hands raised, found a stone for him to sit on. They then stood on either side of Moses, supporting his arms and keeping them steady until sunset. This unusual teamwork led to Joshua and the Israelite army's eventual victory over the Amalekites. Afterward, Moses builds an altar and named it, The Lord is My Banner, signifying God's role in their victory. Not long after, Moses' father-in-law Jethro visited Moses and observed his exhaustion from single-handedly leading the people. He advised Moses to delegate responsibilities. This significant moment highlighted the need for shared leadership and reduced burden on one man, Moses. This delegation was not just about alleviating Moses' burden, but also about embodying the image of God in the community, reflecting his justice mercy, and leadership. After three months of traveling through the desert, the Israelites reached Mount Sinai. God called Moses to the top of the mountain and instructed him to prepare the people for a divine revelation. God tells Moses that if the Israelites obey him and keep his covenant, they will be his treasured possession among all nations. He is then instructed to consecrate the people they are to wash their garments and abstain from certain activities as a form of purification in preparation for encountering God. Moses descends from the mountain and conveys God's words to the people. On the third day, with thunder, lightning, a thick cloud, and the sound of a trumpet, God descends upon Mount Sinai. The people were warned not to touch the mountain or cross its boundaries. Only Moses is permitted to approach. God then speaks the Ten Commandments directly to the Israelites from the mountain, amidst smoke and fire. These commandments include directives about worshipping only God, prohibiting idolatry, honoring one's parents, and laws against murder, adultery, theft, lying, and coveting. The Israelites are terrified by the display of God's power and plead with Moses to speak to God on their behalf rather than having God speak directly to them. The encounter with God at Sinai was likened to approaching the sun, too intense for direct contact. Following this, Moses approaches the thick darkness where God is. God gives Moses the commandments written on two tablets of stone. The giving of the Ten Commandments marks a pivotal moment in the Old Testament as it establishes the covenant between God and the Israelites and lays the foundation for their law and ethics. 
God proclaimed to Moses that Israel was to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. However, this covenant required obedience and adherence to God's laws. The people eagerly accepted this covenant, recognizing it as an opportunity for salvation and prosperity under God's just reign. God's vision for the Israelites is reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. He promised Moses a land free from violence and injustice, a place where the Israelites would flourish. God pledged to gradually drive out the inhabitants, extending Israel's borders from the Red Sea to the Philistine Sea and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River. After receiving the commandments, Moses was instructed to gather Israel's leaders for a communal meal with God. During this event, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel witnessed a glimpse of the divine. It is described as a pavement of sapphire stone under God's feet. Remarkably, they saw God and were spared. God then called Moses to ascend even higher on the mountain, taking Joshua with him to stand at a distance while the other elders returned to the camp. To facilitate this, God gave Moses instructions for building a sanctuary, a tangible symbol of God dwelling among his people. Everything was in place. Skilled artisans were raised within the community, laws were established to guide them into God's presence, and even time was sanctified through the institution of the Sabbath. The vision for the Israelites was to be the most fruitful and prosperous among all nations, abundant in happiness and free from worry, if only they trusted in God's character and promises. However, their faith was soon tested. When Moses' return from Mount Sinai was delayed, the people grew restless and doubtful. They approached Aaron, demanding the creation of tangible gods to lead them, as they had lost faith in Moses, the man who led them out of Egypt. Reluctantly, Aaron instructed them to bring their gold jewelry, which they eagerly handed to him. From this gold, Aaron constructed a golden calf, which the people declared as their god, the one who liberated them from Egypt. They engaged in thunderous singing and dancing in jubilation. This act of idolatry deeply angered God, who informed Moses of the people's betrayal. Moses, in turn, was distraught and confused. The worst of it is not only the people's transgression, but also the involvement of his own family in this grave sin. Descending from the mountain, Moses met Joshua, who had heard the commotion but couldn't understand its cause. They both went to meet the people. Upon seeing the golden calf and the dancing revelry, Moses' anger erupted. In a symbolic gesture of their broken covenant with God, he smashed the tablets of the Ten Commandments at the mountain's base. He then destroyed the calf, burning it and grinding it to powder. He did not stop there. He put the powder on water and forced the Israelites to drink. Confronted by Moses, Aaron attempted to deflect blame reminiscent of Adam's response to God in Eden. He told Moses the people made him do it. Moses, seeing the gravity of the situation, asked the people to choose between idolatry and loyalty to God. The Levites quickly rallied to him. Afterward, severe punishment was meted out to all those who participated in the idolatry. This led to the deaths of many by the sword. This harsh judgment underscored the seriousness of their betrayal and sin. After this incident, God instructed the Israelites to move forward from Sinai towards the promised land, Canaan. During their journey, Moses, seeking a deeper understanding of God's nature, requested to witness His glory. God agreed to this extraordinary request. He instructed Moses to carve new tablets for the commandments. He promised to reveal His holiness to Moses, to protect him God sheltered Moses in the cleft of a rock before the revelation of his glory. Moses ascended the mountain once again, 
this time to experience the manifestation of God's glory. As God's holiness passed before him, the Lord proclaimed his nature, merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This declaration highlighted God's dual nature of mercy and justice, forgiving iniquity and transgression, yet holding the guilty accountable across generations. After witnessing God's glory, Moses returned to the people, his face radiating with divine light. The people could not look at his face. To shield them from this overwhelming brightness, a veil was placed over his face. Moses then reiterated key laws to the Israelites. Again, he emphasized the importance of obedience and faithfulness to God. Soon after, Moses and the Israelites started to build the tabernacle, God's temple or palace. This structure, unlike the grand temples built for Pharaoh, was a modest tent that looks more like a garden than anything else. Its unique design and purpose set it apart from the temples of surrounding nations. The Israelites firmly believed that this tabernacle housed the presence of God. Before the tabernacle's completion, Moses had set up a temporary tent of meeting outside the camp. This tent became a place where anyone seeking the Lord could go. Moses remained the intercessor. Whenever Moses entered this tent, a pillar of cloud symbolizing God's presence would descend at its entrance. The people, observing from afar, would stand and worship at their own tent doors as Moses communicated with God. Upon the completion of the tabernacle, God's glory filled it to such an extent that Moses himself could not enter. The completion of the tabernacle brings us to a pivotal moment in Moses' role as the priest of God. The dilemma arises, how can Moses continue to intercede for Israel if he is unable to enter God's manifested presence in the tabernacle? This is what prompted the need for a continuous line of priests, starting with Aaron, to mediate between God and the people. It also shows how this succession of human intercessors cannot be a permanent solution. It hinted at the future need for a perfect, eternal mediator, Jesus, as the Messiah. Despite these challenges, Aaron and future priests are tasked with guiding the Israelites into God's presence and making atonement for the nation's sins. Part of this priestly role involves rituals and other forms of atonement. This was required not only because of the sins of the Israelites, but also of the native inhabitants of the land of Canaan, who indulged in many evil practices, including child sacrifices and idolatry. When the Israelites find themselves unable to uphold his standard, God provides a means of reconciliation, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, on this day, a priest makes atonement for the entire nation's sins. However, Moses' role in God's plan is far from complete. God's next directive to Moses is for him to prepare Israel for impending warfare. In the book of Numbers, we find a detailed arrangement of the Israelite tribes around the tabernacle, their central place of worship. To the south lay the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and Simeon. To the west were Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Dan, Asher, and Naphtali formed the northern border. And to the east, where the sun rises, were Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Judah's formation was notably the largest. At the core of this formation, symbolizing the heart of the Israelite community, was the tabernacle the manifest presence of God among his people. All that has happened to the Israelites since they left Egypt occurred in the outskirts of Canaan. When the Israelites finally set out towards Canaan, their journey was marked by internal struggles. Despite witnessing God's provisions, they again and again grappled with a lack of faith and disobedience. Upon reaching Canaan's border, Moses sent spies to survey the land. The report came back mixed. 
While acknowledging the land's richness and abundance, most spies feared the formidable inhabitants. They told Moses that the land cannot be conquered and that they must retreat to Egypt. Moses was astonished at their lack of faith in God even after everything they have witnessed. God's response to this rebellion was a blend of justice and mercy. Rather than giving them over to their desire for enslavement or death at the hand of the Egyptians, he decided on a form of exile for that generation. God decided that none of that distrusting generation would enter the Promised Land. Access to the Promised Land was deferred to the next generation. So the Israelites roamed the wilderness for another generation. It was around this period that some people in the community decided to engage in rebellion against Moses. The rebellion led by Korah, Dathan, and Abiram against Moses further illustrated the ingrained distrust of the Israelite generation in God's guidance. Despite this, through several miraculous signs, God reaffirmed that Moses and Aaron were his chosen leaders. These continuous challenges weighed heavily on Moses. Once a reluctant leader, he had contended with his own insecurities and struggled with his identity before becoming God's instrument. The death of his sister Miriam in Kadesh, amidst the wilderness of sin, marked the beginning of a prolonged period of personal trial and hardship for Moses. The continuous discontent of the people of Israel was the source of Moses' frustration, which made him unable to fully follow God's instructions. As we said earlier, confronted with the grudge of the people, Moses received instructions from God to speak gently to a rock to get water. Instead, overwhelmed by frustration and fatigue, he struck the rock twice with his staff in anger. This was a significant failure on Moses' part. Instead of mirroring God's patient and merciful character, he reflected the people's distrust and impatience. For this, he paid a heavy price. God told him he could not enter the promised land. This is because if he were to enter the promised land, he might succumb to actions that would lead to bloodshed and injustice, contrary to God's will. Jesus Christ later echoes this sentiment in his teachings when he said that both physical murder, anger, and resentment are perversions of God's justice. Moses' failure thus serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of allowing frustration and distrust to override faith and obedience. Moses, the prophet, priest, and de facto king during Israel's exile, was weighed down by the burden of a fallen world and sin. Despite his significant role, he was unable to enter the promised land. The Israelites, leaving a place of desolation, found themselves wandering aimlessly in the wilderness for a longer period than necessary. It was during this period that Aaron died. Again, the Israelites' frustrations and despair intensified. Their distrust for God grew. The question then arises, how will God both uphold justice and provide salvation? The story of the bronze serpent offers an answer. God instructed Moses to make a bronze serpent. Those who looked upon it, acknowledging their need for salvation, were saved. Those who did not, were not. This symbolizes the eradication of injustice and the path to salvation through faith. After three decades of wandering, battles, and encounters with many adversity, a new generation of Israelites arrived at the border of Canaan. In his final acts, Moses delivers a powerful message to the new generation, which contained in the book of Deuteronomy. These teachings are meant to prepare their hearts and minds for entering the promised land under God's guidance. Ultimately, Moses appoints Joshua as the new leader of Israel and ends his journey on an emotional note. God showed Moses the promised land from a mountaintop, but he could not enter. Moses died at the age of 120.
This somewhat sad end to Moses' life serves as a powerful reminder of the consequences of distrust in God and the importance of faithfulness to His commands. Thus, the story of Moses is not just a historical account. It carries a profound theological weight. It sets the stage for the ultimate fulfillment of these roles in the Messiah, who is to be the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, and the perfect king, the one who would crush the serpent and bring order out of chaos. Moses' life and legacy, therefore, serve as a precursor and a contrast to the anticipated Messiah, who perfectly embodies God's justice, righteousness, and truth. What man could not do, the Son of God would. Jesus Christ's fulfillment of the law in Moses happened at an event atop Mount of Configuration. Jesus, accompanied by three disciples, undergoes a transformation while praying on the mountain. As he prayed, his face and clothes radiate with a divine brightness. Then Moses, along with Elijah, appears beside him in glorious splendor. They conferred with him for a while before they disappeared. This moment, known as the Transfiguration, symbolizes the convergence of the Law, Moses, the Prophets, Elijah, and the fulfillment of both in Jesus, the Messiah. This positions Jesus not just as a successor to Moses, but as the culmination and fulfillment of all that Moses and the Prophets were tasked with completing. Therefore, the story of Moses becomes more than a historical account. It serves as a precursor to the greater story of salvation found in Jesus Christ. Through him, we inherit the promises and fulfillments of God's plan, continuing the legacy of faith, obedience, and redemption that Moses so significantly represents. This is the essence of Moses' story, a story that finds its completion in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our God, King, and Savior. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, you will also like the complete story of Apostle Paul and the complete story of Apostle Peter. I will leave the links in the description. We welcome your comments and support. This work is a product of an in-depth research, but we are not perfect. If you find a mistake of fact or substance, please be kind in your correction. Support us by subscribing to this channel. Like and share this video to everyone you know. The work of the kingdom requires time, commitment, and money. We can always provide the first two, but need help with the last. You can help us by sending YouTube super thanks, if you are so led. If not, we still always appreciate and love you sincerely. Please keep listening to God's word as we all await the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.